welcome to an amazing American, and in my opinion, the next President of the United States of America, Hillary Rodham Clinton. appreciate greatly that warm welcome. It's great to be here at this extraordinary university. I echo everything the mayor said about it. I'm prejudiced because my nephew is a junior here, uh, so I have good uh, personal information about what an extraordinary place this truly is. I want to thank the mayor for convening this meeting and giving us a chance to present to all of you and through the media millions of more people in Southern California, the rest of the state, and indeed our country. To hear from those who are part of the effort uh, to really knit our communities together in a way that makes us stronger for many reasons, but particularly to be engaged in a common understanding of the importance of standing against those who would rip us apart for any reason. The recent months with the attacks that we've seen from Lebanon to Turkey to Paris to San Bernardino, now to Brussels and other places as well, as the mayor referenced in Africa, have really once again brought to the forefront the importance of the work that the four panelists here do every day, not just when terrorism is in the headlines, but bringing people together, looking for common ground. And I'm especially pleased to be participating in this because I think it's important that we hear these voices, not just the hot rhetoric and the demagoguery that I think is not either useful or reflective of who we are as a people. It is not only often offensive, but dangerous. And therefore, I want to help broaden the conversation, the way the mayor described it being carried out right here in Los Angeles. So I will be doing as much listening as talking, because I want the men and women who will be addressing this issue from each of their perspectives to have a chance to be heard, not to be drowned out by politics, by partisanship, by hot rhetoric, but to really make clear that what they do and what they stand for is what all of us should be supporting. I want to end by referencing a story that was in the press in the last 24 hours about a taxi driver in Brussels. This gentleman of Moroccan origin heard about the attacks and immediately wondered whether the three passengers he had taken to the airport that day who he thought were somewhat strange acting, could have been involved. And what he did was to reach out immediately to law enforcement, say, I picked up these three men. I can tell you where I picked them up. Just as we did in New York after 9-11, urging every community to be part of our common defense and saying, if you hear something or see something suspicious, report it. This gentleman did exactly that and led the police to what seemed to be a stronghold of the terrorists, including a lot of ammunition, bomb-making materials, and the like. Now, <clears throat> I mention that because I think it's important for all of us to recognize and then to affirm the common defense that we are committed to in our country. 
cannot allow our nation to be pitting groups of people against one another. We cannot give in to panic and fear. It's not in keeping with our values. It's not effective in protecting us. And it plays into the hands of terrorists who want nothing more than to intimidate and terrorize people, turn against each other, which leads to radicalizing more people and creating even greater problems for us. So I appreciate this chance for us to hear from these four panelists, and I thank the mayor uh, for recognizing the timeliness of this discussion and bringing us here uh, to USC. Mayor, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary. <clears throat> thank you for your work and your experience and for your uh, open ears as we share Los Angeles's experience. Our, the first person I'm going to turn to is Jumana Silian Saba, who is a adjunct professor. Uh, she also, full disclosure, uh, works with me at City Hall, though she's here in her private capacity this afternoon, and is heading up some of the work that we're doing to putting together a, a countering violent extremism um, initiative. It's founded on key principles um, of being able to prevent, to intervene, and to interdict extremists and extremist acts when they happen. So we're very pleased to have her here, and why don't you share some of your thoughts with the Secretary first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, Madam Secretary. It's wonderful to have you with us and to engage this very critical conversation in a very critical time. So very much thank you for being here. Um, one of the most important discussions that we're having is how do we engage our communities? And in all reality, it's the leadership that we have here at the city. It's the leadership of Mayor Garcetti. Uh, but it's also the courage of our people to come out and really engage a very difficult conversation, one that we will be having today and perhaps for the next generation to come. The work that we do here um, in the city of LA could not be possible without the partnerships that we have with our communities. It couldn't be possible without the input that we have from our communities and our ability to build strong intervention and strong prevention comes as part of a partnership, not only in terms of our government partnerships and the partnerships that we form with our government agencies, but it's also the partnerships that we form with our faith communities. It's the partnership that we form with our social services, our mental health professionals. Um, it takes all of these areas of expertise in order for us to come with something that is comprehensive and something that truly meets the needs of our community. Um, and so this is the foundation of our work in LA. It really is focused on, um, and it really stands on um, the civil rights of our people, which is a cornerstone, not only to our identity, but to our framework. But it is also the premise that it's resilient communities, that it's healthy, strong, resilient communities who are really our strongest defense against violence, all form of violence, and particularly ideologically motivated violence. So these are the cornerstones of not only our framework, but truly our approach, we've, which has been for the past several years, working with our academic institutions, um, USC, and, and working with, with Bria Lascoda, who we will be hearing from, you know, working with people like Salam al Mariati and several of you who I already see in the audience, who are very much not only the strong voices in the community, but you are truly the leaders in which we rely on as we move forward in building this very um, important aspect of our, um, of our framework. So. I promised we'd let everybody speak, but you mind if I can go Oprah for just a second with a follow-up. Um, I wanted to ask you, what cities are doing this across the, the nation? And, you know, is this something that's uncharted territory? Do you feel like we have good conversations happening? And what can the federal government role play? Because we have the ears of the future president here to help knit together these initiatives at the local level with kind of a national standard. Certainly. So there are three cities uh, which are um, working on this. Um, initially, um, DHS and the White House had recognized uh, Boston, Minneapolis, and Los Angeles. Um, and, and one of the reasons Los Angeles in particular was recognized is because of the many years of work uh, that has laid the foundation 
for our partnerships uh, through our interagency collaboratives with local federal law enforcement agencies, but also because of the uh, foundational work that we had laid in building relationships with our community. So essentially the framework for LA was built with tremendous input uh, from our communities, um, and they were in fact part of the drafting uh, of that. And so because of a lot of that foundational work that was laid in the city of LA, uh, the White House recognized LA and the framework for LA um, at the White House summit uh, in February. Um, and we were uh, there presenting um, with uh, several of our community peoples and you uh, who are already in the audience um, as well. Um, but one of the most critical things as we move forward um, is our ability to uh, provide the needed resources so that we are investing in our communities, that we are building capacity within our communities, because they are truly our defense line. Uh, and it is our ability and it is the ability of our local as well as our federal government to put the resources in the needed investment so that we are truly supporting a community-driven and a community-based initiative. Hello. Lama Mariotti heads up the Muslim Public Affairs Council. We're, this is our second appearance this week together, unfortunately, because of the Brussels tragedy. Um, and I want to thank him for joining with us that next morning. when we stood together to let people know the role that they could play in making this city safer. And you certainly have been a huge partner in that. I want to thank you and turn the microphone over to you. Thank you. Well, first, let me just say, as, as an introduction, um, I, I walked in here and I felt some suspicion and uh, it's not because I'm a Muslim, but it's because I'm a graduate of UCLA. <laughs> <laughs> so, but in all seriousness, I think both the secretary and the mayor, and I think all of us really are, are, are onto something, that we cannot win with a them versus us mentality. That there are those who are on their side, the visitors, the rival, and then there's the home team. And when the home team commits acts of violence, it's, it's our guys. Um, but when they commit acts of violence, then um, it's an international crisis. So we need to all be on the same team in effective counterterrorism policy. We cannot be fighting each other. As the Secretary said, that's exactly what ISIS wants. They see this as a war between Islam and the West. And the more you fuel that rhetoric, the more you play into their hands. And our biggest problem, honestly, as American Muslims, is we're just having a tough time getting our voices heard. Everywhere you go, they say, what we just heard from you is great. You condemn terrorism. Why are we not hearing that enough? We had uh, a rally with the mayor, 1,000 civic leaders. and coming out against extremism and, and violence. It was not heard. It didn't register. We need to figure out ways to work together in amplifying the moderate voice. The moderate voice is the voice of Nahla Kayali, who's here from Access, who deals with refugees and resettling them in developing positive identity formation integrated into American society. The positive voice is when we are with Rabbi Sharon Brous, in forming Muslim-Jewish partnerships, partnerships in Los Angeles, that we will not allow the politics of the Middle East to divide us. It will redouble our efforts to come up with solutions. Then, we amplify the moderate voice against ideological extremism that uses religion for legitimacy. That ISIS represents cruelty, Islam represents mercy. That ISIS represents destructive behavior, Islam says to go and build a civilization. That ISIS says we are going to intimidate anyone who disagrees with us, whereas Islam says repel evil with good so that the one with whom there is some enmity becomes as if he is your closest and warmest friend. So that voice that is based on exposing the moral bankruptcy of uh, ISIS and bolstering the voice of mainstream communities who are working. Just down the street, for example, there is a free medical clinic that was developed by Muslim doctors called Ummah Clinic. There are people engaged in civic engagement every day. We are 
hearing sermons from in mosques and Muslim conventions against, against extremism, if we can partner with them and amplify that voice, I think that would be a good step in saying that we are united against terrorism. We will not be divided by terrorists or any kind of hate mongering. If, if I could underscore something that Salam just said, because I think it's a real lesson or message for all of us. It's becoming, in a time where we have so much information that is just swirling around us in ways that were unimaginable even a decade ago, it's become harder and harder for moderate, reasonable voices to be heard. Think about it. The way you get eyes or ears is to be provocative, even extreme, to say things that are going to draw attention. That'll get you invited back, or that'll get you more you know, responses to whatever it is you're posting. And I don't think this is a trivial issue, because you hear, as I do all the time, people saying, well, why don't American Muslims speak out? They do. They do. In many different ways. Why aren't they given platforms then for their voices to be heard, at least to counteract the more extreme voices that get an audience anytime they desire. So I want to reinforce this fundamental point that was just made. We've got to do a better job, which is one of the reasons why the mayor and I are here, and we have, thankfully, a lot of media here. We want to do a better job using our platform to elevate the voices and the views and the activities of those who are living this every single day. But I would just ask all of us to think how we can do more of that. After this, after this gathering is over and we all go our separate ways, how do we keep lifting up the voices of those who are on the front lines and part of the common defense? And I certainly will look for good ideas about how to do that and will try to contribute the best I can, but this has to be a conscious effort by every aspect of society so that we do amplify the voices that you were not only describing, but you are a leader of. Thank you. Uh, Jim Featherstone is the <coughs> president of the Homeland Security Council, a job he's been on for almost a month. But before that, and for many years, he was probably the nation's top local emergency management director. Uh, the general manager of our emergency management department, a former chief of our fire department, a man who has had extraordinary partnerships and understands whether it's riots, shootings, earthquakes, floods, what emergency management is all about. And violent extremism is a focus for uh, this city of making sure that we counteract and intervene before events happen. I think it's one of the pillars of his leadership that he always said that whether it's an earthquake or something man-made, it's how well we also prepare and recover from these incidents. So I want to thank him for his leadership, open up the microphone for some of his thoughts to Jim Featherstone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Secretary. It's an honor to be here this morning and uh, speak. Uh, uh, from the public safety perspective, uh, I've spent three decades um, working here in Los Angeles where literally the wolf is at the door every day whether it's man-caused or, or natural, there's always something to be concerned about here. Uh, one of the five things that we say keeps us awake at night here is violent actors. And whether it's, uh, it's domestic-born or foreign-initiated, uh, the issue of violent actors is a real concern. That being said, our ability to detect, deter, prevent, respond to, and recover from these issues is actually a whole of community and whole of government effort. Uh, what, we, what you see here in Los Angeles is probably one of the most collaborative big city efforts in terms of the, the public response, but that public response doesn't stand alone. Uh, a, a cornerstone of the, the collaborative public response here is an outreach to the whole of community. 
I was asked recently in, in my new position, well, what's going to be our effort to the community? And I said, which one? Because, uh, you know, L.A. is, is, is uh, the, the diaspora city. So the, the various communities here, whether they're communities of faith, communities because of economic stratification, language, ethnicity, et cetera, uh, it's, it's the whole of community that's important here. And having just uh, left the mayor's employee, uh, I know that the, the public safety effort here is keenly aware of the various communities. For me to dovetail into the work at the HSAC is important too because the HSAC was spun up like so many other Homeland Security Advisory Councils in the wake of 9-11. The one here is very active, it's very uh, conscious of being able to uh, uh, exercise and leverage the public-private partnership as well as reaching out to the various communities here in the city. So whether it's, uh, like I said, communities of faith, communities because of economic issues or, or cultural background or language. Uh, nine of the ten most vulnerable communities in the county of Los Angeles are in the city of Los Angeles. So it's very important to understand those vulnerabilities, not necessarily vulnerabilities in terms of their ability to, to uh, respond and recover, but just their vulnerability in terms of perspective. Uh, we, in such a, a visible media-driven uh, society these days, we have to be very, very conscious of the light that's shed upon in the context in which we see the various communities in Los Angeles. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for the, the practical on-the-ground experience that I know we'll continue to talk about as we continue the conversation. But we go back to a Trojan to uh, round us out here. Uh, <laughs> Pri Lascada is the executive director of USC's Center for Religion and Civic Culture. Um, which is as wide encompassing as it sounds. So why don't you share a little bit about what you do here and I know you bring a, a lot of broad experience on these issues together. So when you're looking at both the academic and the practical implications of this thinking, uh, what you'd like to share with us today. Sure. So about 20 years ago, I started my first day as a USC undergrad. Um, so congratulations to all of you Trojans who are here on a remarkable career. Um, our center actually started at a very dark moment for Los Angeles, which was the 1992 civil unrest. And it was a professor here at USC, Donald Miller, who was driving over the freeway, the, 101, the 105 to the 110, and saw the fires in South Los Angeles. And when he got home on TV, he saw Reverend Cecil Murray, who was then the head of First Amy Church, who's now at our center here, uh, really channeling the anger of community and calling for peace and calm at the same time. And so our center's roots are really in the ashes of that difficult day for Los Angeles, trying to understand how we build a civic society, how we build a community that respects, honors, and enhances the pluralism that is inherent to America and looks at community not as a, a problem to be solved, but as potential to be unlocked. And that's really the cornerstone of our work. Regardless of what community it is, we don't see anyone as particularly suspect. We see everyone that we work with, uh, whether it's uh, in Los Angeles and South LA where we do a lot of work, or I just got back from running a program that started under Secretary Clinton uh, called Generation Change in Morocco, working with young youth leaders uh, who do work in uh, post-conflict societies. No matter who we work with, we see them not as suspects, but as fellow citizens. And that value, that fundamental value of pluralism and of real inclusion makes our work acceptable and transformative for the communities we work in. I was in Uganda last summer, and everyone I was, wor was uh, with was worried about being in Uganda because it was about five years after the El Shabaab attack uh, on the soccer stadium. And the people I was working with in U Uganda were people who were survivors from that attack. And when that happened, when I was there was the Charleston shooting. And so people would say, you're in Uganda, but we have three ordained AME pastors in my office. And that was the thing that was heavy on my heart, was the concern and fear of the kind of uh, radicalism that happens across communities and across this country that we're, we're seeing. The scaredest I have ever been was the day after the Oak Creek Temple massacre in Wisconsin. I was in a, uh, a Langer Hall, which is the Sikh public service where they prepare food and give it uh, away for free, on Robertson Boulevard. 
and I was working with them to bring them into a collaboration we had um, when you were running the emergency management department. So they would use their food trucks, this is very Los Angeles, they'd use their food trucks <laughs> to serve people uh, in the wake of a disaster, and uh, Jim Featherstone's office has done a remarkable job of including community. But 24 hours before, there was a shooting at a temple, and I sat looking at the door wondering, you know, here I am at a place fundamentally about inclusion and service, and I am scared. And I think that that's the reality that many of the communities that we work with deal with, is their concern for their own safety while they're being asked to counter terrorism or counter extremism. And we have to understand that tension, because <coughs> that tension makes this work more difficult. But um, there was, I think, someone very near to some of us here who said that there's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed with something uh, with what's right with America. And those values of pluralism, inclusion, service, and togetherness, I think, are what Los Angeles really holds for me, and that's what our center works on. Oh, I um, really appreciate um, your approach to this, and the center uh, from the briefing I received is truly an inclusive center, looking at so many different aspects of how to um, create more community resilience, responsiveness, integration, uh, inclusion. And, and I wanted to uh, mention a conversation I had a few months ago, which ties into um, the community approach, because I was in Minneapolis. And some of you may uh, know that uh, we have a large Somali-American community in Minneapolis. And for a period of time, uh, young Somali-Americans were being recruited into Al-Shabaab. And this was a total uh, shock to the community. And it was as we sometimes read uh, now, uh, literally waking up and finding your son gone and then finding that one of his friends is gone and then weeks later finding that he's in Somali and that maybe hearing that he's been killed. And that was what began the process of the community in Minneapolis coming together and working with a broad range of other institutions, uh, obviously including law enforcement, but also academic institutions, civic groups, and the like. And when I was meeting with these leaders of the Somali American community and the broader Muslim American community in the area, they were very committed to continuing their work to be part of uh, what they viewed as a community response. But they also told me that for the first time, they were scared. It wasn't just the fear that you might lose your child uh, who gets radicalized because they thought they were coming to grips with that and understanding better how to engage with the young people. In fact, a Somali-American young man was just elected to the Minneapolis City Council first in the country to achieve that kind of elected office. So they were feeling very much part of the uh, broad-based response that we are hoping to engender. But then they started hearing a lot of the rhetoric in the political campaign that we are in the midst of. And one father said to me, he said, I've never been afraid to be in America. And, you know, there, there are problems like there are in every country but now my children are worried about going to school. They're worried that they will be called names. They're worried that they will be bullied. They're worried that they will be labeled uh, something they are not. And it goes to your experience, Bree, being in the organization with Sikhs, who, as we know, have been subjected to hate crimes and violence because of their distinctive appearance in many instances. And so how, how do we um, counter what are uh, the, the messages of negativity, of exclusion, uh, of discrimination in a way that can be heard 
and accepted so that we can you know, not be deterred or detoured from this work of community building. And, and maybe if you could respond, and then Slam, if you could. It's a, it's a great question. It's the $64,000 question. It, I think there are a few things that we've learned along the way. One is it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. So we can have the best frameworks on paper, we can have the be best intentions, but if we don't have this whole of government approach, where on one side the government is reaching out with an open hand, and on the other side the perception and sometimes the reality is that community experience is the iron fist of government, that makes it uh, an incredibly difficult uh, conundrum for people who want to be included to be part of the solution. Um, the amplification issue is always a problem. Uh, in Los Angeles, we have during Ramadan an amazing organization called the ILM Foundation, um, and they serve tens of thousands of people every day in Skid Row uh, and all across Southern California as part of their Muslim faith, and they get no cover. And then the other is investment, investment, investment. It's not necessarily money, but it's opportunity and partnership. Uh, one of the things that the LA Emergency Management Department did was create a roundtable for faith leaders so that faith leaders could come together and be part of any preparedness or response activity. And it's really remarkable because unless you're really a nut, you don't think that Muslims cause earthquakes, right? <laughs> unless you're really crazy, you don't think that it's, you know, uh, the LGBT community that's responsible for hurricanes. And so when these natural disasters happen, we're all in it together. And that's what I think uh, the LA model in terms of emergency response has produced, which is a sense of togetherness, especially around these natural disasters, because they are no one's fault, but we are all subject to um, the kind of vulnerabilities. And that, I think, is a national model. But I think the superficiality of that wore out quickly when we realize it isn't just learning about each other's cultures. That can be the byproduct of something more profound, but that's not enough into itself. What we have to be able to do is to actually have common work together outside of this discussion so that there are those places and those times when we're dealing with how do we get rid of graffiti, building a park, deal with natural disasters, whatever it is, where we invite all communities in, then it's not also certain communities. We're not just going to tap the Muslim community because there's another terrorist incident. They're fully partners in all the work that we're doing to clean up our streets, pave more streets, improve the airport, whatever it is. And so that's part of the model that we'd love to see help go nationally is that there's a, it's a value that's integrated into government work, not just a peripheral area of governmental work. And that's the type of thing where, the, where government agencies, <clears throat> as, as they roll out this kind of work, their job is to set the table wider and wider so that more people can participate. And to reduce the barriers for participation, because it's not always easy for every community to join the table. And I think that we're continuing to push on that front in Los Angeles. Well, I think the key word is partnership. And partnership in this particular issue requires that law enforcement is dealing with the criminal justice side of it, whereas community is dealing with the ideological, social, religious side. There's a division of labor. Um, and, and so that healthy partnership where communities are treated as partners, not as suspect communities, is critical in moving forward. And we have to uh, realize that it has worked. One out of six terrorist, terrorist plots have been foiled because a community member stepped forward and informed law enforcement when something was wrong. And we have to build on that. And we have to allow people that safe space. We have a safe spaces program that is about prevention and community-led intervention programs. So we have to allow that feeling that when they meet with law enforcement or when they meet with local government and federal uh, law enforcement, that there's that feeling that we are working together on this, that we're not working against a, a community, but more importantly, that we're working together against ISIS online radicalization of people. The mosques are not the centers of radicalization. The mosques are the asset. Mosques are our strengths. The mosque is where we can leverage community leaders to tell the mother or the father or the brother or the sister if when they know something is wrong, I'm not going to be able to tell. Nobody around this table can detect that. But when somebody who is dealing with that, that family member or that close friend or somebody they're mentoring, they know when something is wrong, they know where to turn to for services. 
and it becomes a mental, public, religious health issue. So we have to convert from looking at it purely as a criminal justice matter to a public health matter. And I learned that from Gregory Boyle. When we sat down, we were talking about gang violence prevention and violent extremism. And we're looking basically at the same thing. When people feel they don't belong, they look to other causes. And we have to be able to intervene and rehabilitate that person rather than force them into either incarceration or go join a violent extremist group abroad. But again, we have to understand that what, is, what has happened in the last 20 years, even before 9-11, more Muslims have joined the Marines than have joined international groups. More Muslims are now part of our homeland security apparatus as analysts, as translators, as strategists, than those who go and support uh, foreign groups uh, abroad. More Muslims are involved in saving lives as doctors than they are committing acts of terrorism here. And that understanding, that framework is so critical in approaching this problem so that that helps us amplify this, amplify this voice. That helps us uh, develop a multiplier effect. Let me just end by saying that we have to see that American Muslims are part of the solution. When we see that American Muslims are part of the solution, that sizes ISIS down, that puts them in their place, that they are nothing more than a mafia and criminals that use the veneer of religion to support their cruel, barbaric practices. And their aim is to terrorize us. So we should say once and for all, we will not be terrorized. We will prevail over terrorism together in a united front. And for those who exploit the situation here in the United States politically, all I have to say is, well, as they say, haters going to hate. <laughs> we got to get over it and move on and work together with more solutions. This program that we're talking about here, the LA framework, the Boston and Minnesota framework, are, are, are models of community partnerships, of empowering communities, and that's the way we should view them. Not, let's go talk to the people so that they can root out their radicals. The radicals are being told, detach yourself from the mosque. Detach yourself from the family. That's what a lone wolf is. And, and in part, that's because the mosques have rejected the ideology of al-Qaeda and ISIS. Because we feel that America is our home. Home is not where my grandparents are buried. Home is where my grandchildren are going to be raised. I think we have about five minutes left, so I want to um, ask Jumana to actually talk about what this feels like on the on the on the battle lines right here. We've seen, uh, which is maybe a measure of success, an uptick in the number of people who reach out asking for intervention as people learn that this model is out there. The Human Relations Commission of the City of Los Angeles offers <coughs> those sorts of services. How often are we having people reach out to the city saying, I have a family member, a friend, a colleague, somebody who needs help, and what happens at those moments? Sure. So there are obviously those um, instances where uh, families, parents, friends reach out. Um, and this is sort of the idea of building a strong network of um, service providers and community-based organizations, and it's because of those relationships that we're able to refer to the appropriate services. Um, I know Access and Nahla Kayeli was mentioned earlier. This is an example of an organization where they provide the type of wraparound services uh, that we need for our family. Um, the idea of building off-ramps um, is something um, very much in, in the thought that there are um, various elements in which we can um, intervene very early on before an issue or before um, an isolated person feel that they need to sort of um, commit an act of violence um, in return. So if we look at something, for instance, in San Bernardino, um, if we very closely look at that and our ability to provide the types of social services very early on could have potentially caught some of the very early indicators. And so our focus is on our ability to identify early indicators, um, but also our ability to provide the types of social services 
the appropriate social services that are culturally appropriate, that are meeting the very specific needs. Um, and, and certainly having uh, the Human Relations Commission at the City of LA has truly been instrumental in terms of uh, the ability to convene um, communities across race, across religion, across ethnicities, and sort of the notion of this pluralistic society is no longer a concept. It's a reality that we live through our discussions, but also through the various um, activities that we carry um, in the community and with the community. Um, one of the things that we have coming up is a day of religious pluralism, for example. The day of religious pluralism was a formal resolution which the City Human Relations Commission, working with our um, interfaith advisory group, um, they drafted the statement and it was very formally before City Council. So when we talk about giving platform, um, it's that sort of formal platform that helps amplify the voices. Uh, the work continued and now on April 21st, it's every April 21st is the day of religious pluralism for the city of LA um, and we will be doing, carrying out citywide services through social media, through activities and, and services in the community. So these are the, the kinds of examples of what it means to have a cohesive society. And the notion that in a cohesive society, we squeeze out that space where violent ideology can take root. Um, and so the more we are working together as a community, and this is really not a burden of, of one particular community, this is not a burden of the Muslim community, this is all of us as Angelinos, as Americans, that we come together to confront this. And what can everyday people do to be involved in this? So, so two words, Mr. Mayor, I've, I've heard uh, Bree and Salam. And you, yourself and the secretary have even mentioned, uh, talk about convening and empowering. So, and I think government and also uh, concern uh, private sector groups and nonprofit groups, in, these, in this time, in our history, in this country, more than ever have an opportunity and a responsibility to convene, uh, to provide the forum for the various groups and, and factions to, to come together. And I think through uh, what would be a simple thing here in LA, such as preparedness and uh, readiness, it empowers folks. And empowered uh, communities uh, are less likely to fall prey to the nonsense that we hear, whether it's foreign born nonsense or these days domestically driven nonsense. So I think to con uh, government and, and private sector organizations, like I said, have a responsibility and an opportunity to be greater conveners right now. And that convening brings the folks together to we, we create this sense of empowerment. People who, we've, we've seen this in the preparedness world, that communities could be very diverse. I think the ballot here is printed in nine languages. So yeah, that just, that's the official, you know, uh, uh, differences in the, uh, in terms of LA. But I think bringing the, the diverse communities together and creating a sense of awareness, a sense of uh, self-determination, a self-defined, self-determined community is, is much more resilient in, in the face of of these, these adverse, you know, effects that we have to deal with every day, and certainly in the area of violent extremism. Secretary, would you like to have any concluding <coughs> remarks? Well, I want to thank um, thank all of you. This is, uh, you know, an incredibly useful discussion. I hope that it will be replicated uh, in many places in many different settings, where people will be convened uh, in order to. Uh, have candid conversations. There is so much misinformation and there is fear and anxiety that cuts across all communities uh, about people's security, about their um, self-determination, about their acceptance, about their ability to keep themselves and their children uh, safe and on a track that uh, they believe will lead to a better a better outcome for them and uh, their families and others. So it's important that we do this in a very consistent manner and where we look for ways not just to convene, but through activities, through an ongoing effort of exchanging ideas about what needs to be done and helping others to do it, we end up empowering people because that is you know, not only at the root of how people get through challenging 
experiences, whether they are, as Jim said, natural disasters or man-made um, challenges. So I, I want to commend LA, um, what you have been doing over a number of years, but also taking it now to this new level, Mayor, really uh, sends a strong signal about what we need to do more of everywhere. Uh, and it gives me a lot of hope uh, because I'm looking for positive examples to point people to who themselves are uncertain about what we need to be doing. And the analogy with gangs is a particularly rich one. You know, people who feel marginalized, left out, left behind, are going to want to join something. LA has a long history of dealing with gangs and doing so more successfully than other cities uh, in our country. And thinking about it in that way may give more Americans an understanding of how you know, there are many paths for us to take to try to counter violent extremism, to try to provide more positive experiences to empower uh, particularly young people. Uh, so I'm encouraged. Uh, I am hopeful that this kind of conversation will find a broader audience. Uh, we like to say in my campaign uh, that love trumps hate, <laughs> uh, and therefore we will look for ways uh, to actually put that uh, into practice and action. And pointing to leaders like those here at this table um, should give uh, not just hope, but a real push uh, to others to come up with their own models and examples and to unite behind them. Uh, that's what we need to do uh, in our country right now. Well, thank you so much uh, to Secretary Clinton. Thank you to our host, the USC uh, student government, uh, who invited us to be here and for people taking time out. I'll, I'll close on the inspiring words of a former First Lady of the United States. In my first class here uh, that I taught, it was um, international human rights. And the very first day of the first class, I started by opening up with a quotation that came on the 10-year anniversary of the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that reminds us that this global work that we do is so local. Now, it could have been, but it wasn't said by Hillary Rodham Clinton. It was said by <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt. And I usually paraphrase, but in form, in, in, next to a former Secretary of State, you have to be exact. So the quote is, where, after all, do human, universal human rights begin? In small places close to home so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless those rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerned citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. Madam Secretary, you have been the embodiment of that global vision of what American localism is. And we hope that here in Los Angeles, we can continue to innovate and to inspire, and with your leadership, make sure that that spreads throughout this land and throughout this world. Please join me in thanking our next president, Hillary Rodham. Thank you.